folks, it's just that easy. Hey folks, it's just that easy. You mix it up, you fix it up, you do it yourself. He can turn your little shack into a first class castle. Save you time and money and a great big hassle. Hey folks, it's just that easy. You mix it up, you fix it up, you sand it down, you paint it brown, you measure twice, you cut it once. It's just that easy. Good morning. Welcome to the Ask Shell webcast. I'm Michael Gibson, General Manager of Shell Buzzy's House Smart Home Services. It is Sunday, January 20th. Thank you for tuning in this morning. We're glad to have you with us. If you're new to the show, um, what we do during the Ask Shell webcast is take questions we've received from our House Smart Club members from across Canada and even outside of Canada, across the world, and we answer them for you. So you get the same information that they're getting home improvement tips, information, everything you need to know about your home is uh, what we like to bring to you during the webcast here. So first again, thank you for tuning in. You're on AskShell.com. And if you can't watch the whole show for some reason, you can also come back to our website in the future, and we have them archived on our home page. You can watch them whenever you like at a time that's convenient for you. Uh, we're now streaming them using YouTube as well, which means you can watch them on your iPad, iPhone, anything Mac-based, Apple-based, you can use that as well. So um, it's great. It's free. We don't fill the show full of commercials, so uh, we hope you enjoy the show. We have a new show every Sunday at 9 a.m., and we play that show throughout the week on our homepage, AskShell.com. You can come back at any time and watch the show. So uh, we do take questions through our website. If you're not a member, it's quick and easy to sign up. All you do is you visit AskShell.com. At the top, you'll see a button saying, How Smart Club Member, Sign Up or Sign In. Sign up, username, password, confirm your address. Takes a minute, everything is free, confidential. We do not sell your information to anybody. No one sees it but us. And uh, you'll get access to sending questions through to Shell. Also our monthly e-newsletter, which goes out to over 36,000 of you, of your club members across Canada. And, uh, and you might even hear your question on the show here. So we've got many, many emails to get through. So we'll, uh, we'll get to the first one before we, uh, we go to a break. Are you ready, Shell? You betcha. Always ready and able. Good stuff. So this is coming from a, a homeowner that's in a strata building, in a condo building. They have two garage floors that were flooded by a water main break and roughed up when somebody used a pressure washer. So obviously someone didn't know what they were doing. Uh -huh. They used a pressure washer, took the surface off, which is not uncommon. Um, they've got an 8 and a 16 car garage in their underground condo building. What would be the proper way to restore smooth finish to this and also what they're wondering uh, what the cost might be per square foot because they probably need to get strata approval before they can do anything so do you have any tips for them at all shell you bet i have uh, michael and uh, thanks again for being with us this morning folks and it's always nice to have this type of question that will help out many many folks especially in underground parkades because underground parkades possibly even in carport parkades or even in garages in some of the older apartment type of buildings so when you're dealing with concrete you've got to be very very concerned about how you go about first of all cleaning it how you go about as far as rinsing it and certainly you want to seal the concrete after you have cleaned it to eliminate any of the concerns uh, down the road with oil or antifreeze or uh, transmission uh, fluids or rear end uh, differential treatments, all that sort of uh, material that can get on. Even garbage uh, uh, truck uh, uh, oils or uh, items that uh, may leak out of garbage cans. All of those items are something that can be a real problem when you're dealing with concrete. So first and foremost, folks, always, always check to see if your concrete is sealed. And if it's not sealed, prepare it and seal it. And that's what I'm going to go through right now. Because in this particular case, as you heard, there's been some uh, uh, real uh, concerns with pressure washing that has caused the etching of the concrete. And etching of concrete... Uh, not only opens the pores to other activities that may or may not uh, get into the concrete, but certainly 
it uh, eliminates that uh, that that washability, if I can use that term. Okay, so first of all, clean the concrete. Now, using the Shell Buzzy Home Cleaning Formula, I happen to have this a bottle of it right here. So there it is right there. And that is available at most of your retail stores, like your Cloverdale Paints and your Home Hardwares and Windsor Plywood stores and uh, the box stores. Uh, this asks for the Shell Buzzy uh, Home Cleaning Formula. It's a powder that you mix with water. And all the instructions are on the packaging. But it's very important to understand that cleaning is number one pressure wash type of cleaning is not something that i consider as a number one uh, means of cleaning concrete you can use it for rinsing yeah you can use it for uh, cleaning if you use one of the pressure washing rotating brushes which you can rent now at rental outlets or have it professionally done but using the cleaning formula, it breaks down the oil in the concrete. Oil is something today, when it goes into concrete, it goes into it. And that's what I mean. It's absorbed by it because concrete is very porous when it's not sealed. And now that this particular project that we've been confronted with, the concrete is not only rough from using too much pressure from the pressure washer, blowing the face of the concrete, which is the cement off the surface, that's the smooth component of concrete finishing, then that has to be smooth after you have it cleaned. You don't want to try to adhere anything to oil that's already in the concrete. So even though the concrete is rough, using the cleaning formula, uh, follow the instructions, spread it out, scrub it, let it sit. Don't do it in the sunshine. Do it in the evening or the early morning hours when the sun is off of the concrete because you don't want it evaporating on you and taking the stain even deeper. So oil will come to the top as long as you follow the instructions. Keep that uh, cleaning formula wet. You can even water it out with a watering can if you need be, okay? Once that has been allowed to sit for 10 or 15 minutes, then give it another scrubbing, and then use you can use your pressure wash to rinse it. But uh, don't uh, put the, uh, the wand of the pressure washer right down close to the concrete because that's only going to damage the concrete more. Use it for a rinse. The wand will send out a nice fan tail and uh, keep it maybe three to four feet away from the concrete and uh, spread it in such a way that you're rinsing it totally. Now, once you've got it clean, and again, it's still in that uh, cool period after the sun's gone off it, there's a product called Bonded Topping Mix. Or there's another one, which is very similar, different brand, called Top and Bond. And those two products do basically the same thing. You can apply it to the surface of the concrete for smoothing the surface of the concrete to a nice uh, washable and certainly gray concrete color. So take either one of them, bonded topping mixer, top and bond, mix it to a very thin slurry. That's just like a, I say McDonald's milkshake, if you've ever had one, but like a milkshake. And mix it up, puddle it out, size of the puddle, the size of a, say, a basketball, and then take a squeegee, a squeegee, and spread it around, filling and giving you a nice, smooth surface. And allowing that now to be cured overnight. So once you've done the squeegee application of the bonded topping mix, now you are ready to seal the concrete. And sealing the concrete, when you wake up next morning, take a look at your job, you're going to say, wow, did that ever do a great job? And some folks will even say, ah, I think I'll just leave it that way. Uh, 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 don't do that. You want to seal it. So once you have it sent, uh, uh, you know, set out in such a way that it's smooth with a squeegee, let it cure for 48 hours. 48 hours. So that's two days. So the following day, then you go down with a product called, uh, you can use two. You can use Zypex. That's a water sealer. Or you can use a product that's called Aqua Seal. And that's a product that Cloverdale Paint make available. 
but they are sealers for concrete. And you want the concrete to actually take and seal, seal it in where it's going to we need it most, and that is on the entire surface. So puddle it out or put it in a watering can and water it out and let it take what it wants. And if there's any puddling of the sealer, then take your squeegee and spread it out even further, letting the concrete take what it uh, requires to fill all those pores. And now you've got a job well done. And that's going to be something that's going to be uh, uh, paintable if you want to paint it uh, after one month and much easier to clean right away as far as every week if you want to sc scrub it down by using a, uh, uh, a mop, that sort of thing. And you can do that. It uh, makes it uh, much easier to maintain. So that's the way you want to prepare, repair, and uh, refurbish it to the point that you can now uh, uh, clean it and maintain it properly. Mike? Now, I guess one part of that question too, Shell, is they were asking if there's any way you can figure out what a approximate cost per foot is. Is there any way you can figure that out? Uh, well, you actually can because it's uh, it becomes somewhat of a uh, calculated effort by yourself as far as, uh, uh, one, the amount of coverage that you get from a bag of your bonded topping mix or the uh, uh, you get... Um, uh, for an example, uh, your bonded topping mix, and then you'll get your sealers, and you take the square footage of each one of those, what it will do for you, and then from that point, divide it by the number of square feet of the slab that you're repairing, and you'll come up with a price. To have it done professionally, we have those people available in most of the areas across Western Canada, and especially in, in Greater Vancouver, that will do that professionally and that would be something that they'd want to go out and take a look at the project right. and then from the project they would uh, in turn a proper estimate do the proper there. estimating yeah okay well thank you very much so we're going to take a quick break we'll be back in a minute so please stay with us and uh, we'll be back our next question is about insulating a, uh, a basement so with the cold weather here that's a quite common question we're getting right now and uh, please stay with us we'll be right back to answer that question for you And now, Ask Shell, brought to you by Springs RV Resort, a proud member of Shell Buzzy's House Smart Home Services. Folks, it has been one year since Frankie and I bought our own RV lot at the Springs RV Resort in Harrison Hot Springs. That's right, we bought our own lot, built a beautiful deck and gazebo, and have had a wonderful summer. Our kids and grandkids love how close we are. In less than an hour, they can make it out to visit us, splashing in the heated pool or relaxing by the fire. The Springs RV Resort is rated one of the top RV resorts in North America and now we know why. The amenities are first class from the spa-like bathrooms to the beautiful gardens. But don't wait till next summer to purchase or rent your own RV lot. The resort is over 70% sold so right now is the time to buy. Folks visit the Springs RV Resort in Harrison for a tour and ask about their special fall pricing or visit online at springsrv.com. And welcome back to the Ask Shell webcast. Thanks for tuning in to the show. We hope you're enjoying it so far. Uh, we're going to jump right back into the emails, and we have another one from one of our House Smart Club members. And uh, with the winter being here, of course, it's about insulating. So they're trying to make a decision on insulating. Um, they're looking at their basement, and they're wondering about if they should use styrofoam. And with a 2x6, so the, the size of the, uh, the wall frame, with one inch styrofoam, would that be effective or would they be better off using one of the bubble wraps? He thinks it's about an R5 value of the bubble wrap and he wants to eliminate the cold transfer between the, the studs. So what are your thoughts on how they should best insulate their, uh, their basement walls? Well, thank you very much, Mike. And uh, that is a question that quite commonly comes up uh, over the, uh, the period of, especially this time of the year, when people tend to come inside from outside and uh, any basement that is unfinished, uh, uh, getting basement finishing done up. And it is something that uh, to do it right, uh, 
has many, many different uh, options as uh, how to go about it. So I think each time I answer this uh, question, I start out by saying that on our website, uh, there is the uh, video of doing a basement uh, uh, finishing uh, program. And we have now uh, put together a basement finishing detail. And you can go to the website, askshell.com, which you are watching right now, the uh, webcast, and uh, go to our homepage and uh, uh, click on the question and answers and type in the search word basement finishing. So you will have uh, a drawing that you can download and uh, follow that. I'm going to take a different approach on the verbal answer here on the webcast because it's uh, uh, one that I can remember uh, possibly a couple of months ago, we did answer this in another manner, but uh, we did have in this email the question about uh, rigid foam insulation and the transfer of cold. And it's a very good question. Uh, first and foremost, uh, most basements today that are being finished are basements that uh, may be in new homes, for example, where they have uh, a basement uh, now to consider for maybe uh, revenue. It could be uh, something that could be a, a mortgage helper, uh, that sort of thing. It could be for one of the loved ones, one of the family members, or maybe just putting one of the, uh, uh, the children, the teenagers downstairs. But in any event, you want a nice, cozy room. And very, very important, uh, number one is once you start finishing a room, you got to remember that when you have started, you want to have a plan in place. And what I mean by that is you want to make sure that you've got uh, all your walls uh, uh, now laid out on the floor. You can do that by chalk lines. Uh, you want to put all your door openings, uh, your closets, uh, your electrical wiring switches, light fixtures, wall sconce. Uh, all of these items should be in place, telephone wires, uh, TV wires, and when in doubt, put them everywhere. That way, at least you won't have wires stringing all over the place. Even take into consider what, what type of flooring that you're going to be uh, putting down. Are you going to use carpet? Are you going to use uh, laminate flooring? Are you going to put uh, a real wood flooring down? All these items come with different uh, installation processes or procedures. Okay, so now, in this particular case, let's deal with the walls. And the walls are really number one, because that is where you'll get cold transfer, keeping in mind that uh, basements are a portion, uh, proportion uh, of the basement wall is in the ground. So you've got maybe anywhere from two to three feet above ground. You may even have a back wall in a concrete uh, walkout basement that's fully out of the ground, with the exception of the footing walls. So all of that has to be taken into consideration. But there's no reason to change uh, the plan as to the process and the procedure. So I'm going to use rigid foam insulation first of all, and then from there we'll go into the finishing detail. Now keep in mind that your floor should always be in place. I'm not going to go to the floor at this time. We'll go to that again. You'll have to keep an eye and an ear to our website, AskShell.com, and uh, we'll certainly keep you informed here on the webcast. But on the wall, minimum one inch rigid foam insulation. This can be the styrofoam, which is the blue product, it can be the fiberglass, the pink product, or you can even use the expanded polystyrene, which is the white product. And uh, all of those can be glued to the wall full height from floor to the underside of your floor joist above. And the reason why I say you can do it all, it's not necessary to do it for code. This is for finishing your basement. That is going to be the cold insulating non-transfer cold from outside in or losing heat to the outside. And that's glued to the wall. And that's uh, either the 2 by 8 sheets, uh, which is the blue or the pink material, or the white being 4 by 8 sheets. And the joist cavity, that's on top of the wall, between the joists, up against the rimmer, that can be sprayed with polyurethane foam, which not only insulates but also stops any uh, air leakage. So all of that is taken into consideration. Then you build your wall. And uh, building a wall in the basement out of 2x6 is a little overkill. And also, why do it when you want to 
uh, the maximum uh, footprint of that uh, square footage. So two by four, especially with the one inch foam up against the wall, two by four frame wall, keep in mind, build it on the floor, swing it up into position, screw it into the underside of the joist, make your wall at least an inch and a quarter, an inch and a half short. That way, at least when you do uh, swing it up, it's going to swing up. It's not going to be uh, impossible because of your joist and your floor height being exactly, in most cases, eight feet. So give yourself that inch and a half, swing it up into position, screw it to the underside of your uh, joist up against the uh, rigid foam insulation. That way, you've got an inch and a half between the underside of your plate on the wall to the floor. And you can just fill that with uh, foam, take inch and a half foam, rip it into strips and tuck it in underneath. And then take your uh, uh, common galvanized nail and drive it down through the bottom plate, through the foam. All you have to do is touch the floor. You don't have to drive it into the floor. You don't have to drill the floor. It's not going anywhere. It's not going to fall over. It's screwed to the joist. And then from that point, put in your insulation, either the rock wool insulation or the fiberglass insulation, uh, or you can spray foam it there as well. And then on with your uh, vapor barrier, if it's the bad insulation, uh, following the instructions up to the underside of the joist and uh, sealing uh, all your electrical boxes and, and uh, switch boxes uh, with the, uh, the, the, the poly caps. And then your drywall tape and acoustical caulking and uh, drywall and finish. It's just that easy, folks. So it's the best way is always the right way. And that's the way I like to guide you is doing it the right way. Any other questions, you can always get in touch with us by email. And as you know already, you are a member, so you have the rights to send me an email. And folks, tell your friends. AskShell.com. Join up to my Housemark Club. And it doesn't cost you a dime. And you've got all the information coming your way. It's just that easy. Mike? And just to remind all the viewers today, if they do want to see a video of a basement finishing project, we do have a clip from Shell's Home Check on our YouTube channel. So if we go to youtube.com slash Shell Buzzy, or to search for Shell Buzzy on YouTube, you'll find our channel. And we have a basement finishing video that was posted probably two or three weeks ago, just before Christmas. And uh, they'll be able to, uh, to see it that way as well. So we'll take another break. And when we come back, we have a question from one of our club members who has a pressure treated wood foundation which is something you also did during home check so please stay with us and we'll be back in a minute and now ask shell brought to you by west coast molding and millwork a proud member of shell buzzy's house smart home services Folks, when people ask me who they should contact about a home finishing project, I always recommend West Coast Molding and Millwork. In the West Coast showroom, you'll see more home finishing options than you ever thought possible. West Coast has a huge inventory of moldings, but they also have stair components, including handrails, wood, or metal spindles, and all the rail fittings to go with it. And with their own millwork shop, West Coast can match any molding or even build you a freestanding spiral staircase. If if you're planning a reno or a new home project, make sure to have West Coast Molding on your team. The West Coast staff have years of experience and super product knowledge. Call West Coast Molding and Millwork at 604-513-1138 or visit westcoastmolding.com. It's just that easy, folks. Well, welcome back to the Ask Shell webcast. Thanks for being with us this morning. Or if you're watching it after, uh, thanks for watching the show. Um, we like to bring you all the home improvement information about your projects around the home. Also, if you're on our website watching, you'll see just above Shell and I, there's a couple links up there. One will say Certified Home Services. One says Certified Products. Now, what you'll find there are their products and services that we've pre-screened. So they're up to Shell standards to make sure that they'll do what they're supposed to do. They're reputable. Products perform as advertised. So if you're looking for anything around the home, if it's roofing, windows, bathrooms, kitchens, drainage, anything, even down to anti-slip treatments for concrete, they're all on our website. So feel free to browse in those areas, 
select where you live, what you're looking for. It'll bring up a list of all the certified members or products that service your area. So we'll go back to the emails. So we have an email here from one of our club members. They start with, my home was built in 1989 and has a pressure treated wood foundation. They want to finish the basement and they need to know if they need to construct new wood framed walls on the exterior walls or can they use the existing foundation framing? Well, you certainly can use the existing and also uh, PWF, a preserved wood foundation, um, have been very, very popular over the last uh, 20 years. And in fact, I've built a couple myself and uh, quite pleased with them. And the one home that we built, which is, was a spec home, I know exactly every time that that home is sold because inside the front closet, it indicates that it was built on top of a preserved wood foundation by Shell Buzzy, and I get a phone call. Always get a phone call from the home inspection services that are inspecting the home prior to uh, the purchase of the home because it's one of the subjects. But in any event, great idea to keep it up as well. Incidentally, folks, right now you're watching the webcast but I just want to make reference as well. Mike just made reference to the uh, Shell Buzzy Hostmart Home Services referral about products and services that we provide uh, throughout Western Canada and certainly uh, very much so in Greater Vancouver. And also we have and we provide Shell Buzzy's Home Improvements, which is a full certified home improvement company that if you're finishing your basement, we specialize in that. We specialize in kitchens. We specialize in bathrooms. We specialize in decks and sidings, anything at all around the home. So just so that you're aware that we are a full service company plus information education for you, the homeowner, if you plan on doing it yourself. So always check. When in doubt, don't pout. Let me, Shell Buzzy, help you out. Preserve wood foundations. If you live in one, if you're building one, make very certain, number one, that you always check with the permits and licensing department in your area to identify if they do understand and appreciate the importance of preserved wood foundations. That is very important because even though it's an approved building program, within the National Building Code. It is all relevant to who is doing the project for you or are you doing it yourself and what sort of information have you in order to proceed with the project. Once you have the preserved wood foundation, finishing it becomes nothing more than a project that you would normally run into on upper levels or above grade because you are dealing with studying. Now, you're dealing with studying in a lot of cases that they may have different centers. Like you may have a 16-inch a center between studs. You may have 12-inch centers between studs. You may have 2x4, two 2x6, two or 2x8 studs because of the structural and because of the, uh, the backfill behind uh, the home or behind the structure on the outside forming the full basement. So all of that being taken into consideration Insulating becomes a very simple uh, type of uh, uh, routine that you would have on the upper levels, as I mentioned before. As far as the depth of the cavity, 2x4, 2x6, 2x8, 2x10 studying, or being 12 inches apart or 16 inches apart or whatever the engineer has specified, then I like to suggest using a product like Roxol Insulation. The reason for it, because it's a very dense insulation, it can be cut to whatever centers is required using a handsaw because it is that rigid that you can cut it with a saw and actually fit it in between. Now, as far as the, uh, uh, the fiberglass insulation or any one of the uh, fiberglass spun type of insulation, no problem. Uh, it's just a matter that you want to make sure that when you do apply it, you don't want to be tucking it in with big uh, folds in it in order to create uh, areas that could be a transfer uh, of cold or moisture into that cavity. So it's very important to have that cavity uh, full, prop full properly. 
or filled properly. And then your polyethylene vapor seal using your wiring uh, switches and duplex receptacles with the plastic caps. Uh, get all your wiring in for all your telephones and uh, TVs and sound or uh, piping for whatever it is that you're going to be putting in. All of these items are very important to have in place before you proceed with the, the wrap-up of polyethylene using acoustical caulking and then your drywall. It's just that easy. Mike? And Jim, the producer is giving us the high sign, so we need to take a quick break here. And when we come back, we have another question uh, regarding someone that saw a new home they're going to possibly purchase, and the heating system is in the attic. And they haven't seen that before, so they want to get your opinion on that. So please stay with us. We'll be right back after this quick break. And now, Ask Shell, brought to you by 21st Century Roofers, a proud member of Shell Buzzy's House Smart Home Services. Folks, there are a lot of different roofing options these days, and I'm always being asked, what type of roof is the best? If you're considering asphalt shingles, fiberglass laminate shingles, metal roofing, or SBS torch on roofing, you should talk to Andrew at 21st Century Roofers. They've been in business since 1978, and for a good reason. With top-notch products, craftsmanship, and service, 21st Century Roofers work hard every day to earn and maintain their reputation. 21st Century Roofers are a master elite certified GAF installer, and they're a local company with thousands of satisfied customers. Call 21st Century Roofers at 604-581-1666. That's 604-581-1666. It's just that easy. Yeah, welcome back to the Ask Shell webcast. We hope you're enjoying this show. Um, before we get back to another email question from one of our House Smart Club members, I want to make reference to uh, different places where you can find Shell Buzzy's House Smart on the internet. So we're on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, all the various social networking websites. So if you want to see us there, just visit any of those websites, search for Shell Buzzy or Shell Buzzy's House Smart. You'll find us. And what we do is we post information quick tips up there, links to articles that we just had published in newspapers or Shell's appearances. Um, so it's up-to-the-date information right to your, obviously, uh, many of you check on your iPhone or your Blackberries, right to your uh, your mobile phone. So it's a great place to get quick tips, information right away from uh, from our office here. So please find us on those websites. And uh, also, we, uh, we hope you let your friends know how to find us as well. So we'll get back to another email here, Shell. Okay, and one of the things I'd like to add there, uh, Michael, if I may, is that it's a good idea as well. If there's any service organizations uh, out there uh, as members and you're watching this program and you're a member of my Shell Buzz the Osmark Club, don't forget that we can provide for you uh, an information uh, uh, voice uh, commercial if you want. I can just simply, it won't cost you anything, but if you belong to a Lions Club or you belong to a uh, social club or something like uh, a Rotary or... Yeah. Yeah. The Lions Easter Seal House, for example, is Ajac Ranch SOS. All these different items for children, especially the Children's Hospital. If you are fundraising, let us know, and we'll put it on our webcast for you. Yeah. It's just that easy. We're more than happy to put up on Twitter and Facebook and right on our webpage in the event area, too, because we have an area it'd be on the bottom right-hand side that's about community events. So if you do have something that you're promoting in the community to raise funds, um, let us know. Call the office, 604-542-2236. Toll free one triple eight two six six eight eight zero six. The number is actually just above Shell and I too on the home page. So let us know. Um, it's straightforward. It's free. We don't charge anything for it. We're glad to help out where we can. And uh, we'll also help out this club member too because they have a question that I think is a an important one for them. They're looking at purchasing a new home. The house has the heating unit installed in the attic. They haven't seen this before. They're trying to do some research as to whether they should still clear of the home. Can't find much on the internet. Uh, she says the attic looks like there is a huge octopus up there with all the ducks, and it's not insulated. So there's no insulation in the attic. It is based in South Surrey, in the the area here of our office. Um, 
they're worried about access and also condensation. The builder, it's a new home, says it's the latest thing and not to worry. So what are your thoughts here, Shell? <laughs> Uh, well, I guess the latest thing, and not to worry, sometimes worries me. Yeah. But uh, uh, that particular approach to heating and air conditioning is very southern uh, orientated. And uh, I can see it happening uh, in this environment in uh, British Columbia. I can see it happening right across the uh, uh, western Canada. Uh, but it, 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 to me, it takes a particular uh, type of application and preparation in order to do that. And keeping in mind that we are dealing with heat pumps today, we're dealing with uh, high efficiency uh, gas fired uh, furnaces, uh, and to locate those units upstairs in uh, the upper cavity area, roof cavity, then you now are dealing with a, an item that is overhead, and maybe right over your head uh, of your bedroom, for example. And uh, it's not something that uh, uh, sometimes is taken into consideration by architects. Uh, keep in mind, architects design, engineers structure, and builders build. So to get all of them to get together on the same page sometimes doesn't necessarily give you that best scenario uh, overhead as far as sound and delivery of the uh, heating and air conditioning. And keeping in mind, these homes normally, with a basement, uh, will have electric heat in the basement because in order to get the heat down there by forced air, it's going to re require uh, somewhat of a, a different approach to design for the heating system. So in most cases, I would say in all cases, basement finishing would be uh, uh, done with uh, uh, electric heat of some sort. But the main floor and the upper floor, air conditioning and heating, uh, with the mechanical furnace and heat pump up in the roof cavity does in fact uh, change somewhat that uh, element of, uh, of concern for me because I am quite uh, aware of the fact that uh, furnaces in the southern part of uh, uh, North America, they're quite common. And uh, here in this part of the country, introducing it, there are going to be a few glitches and uh, there's going to be a few areas of concern like this particular uh, email obviously is bringing. And I do recall this one uh, quite readily because we've uh, talked the uh, the person who wrote the email. Uh, so here's my personal uh, feeling. First of all, you don't want to uh, get yourself committed to something until such time as you've spent uh, sometime in rooms on the upper level when the furnace is on. That way you're going to know the noise factor. The insulation around the unit up in the attic cavity will be insulated the same way as it would be in the event if it was a standard constructed insulated home. Uh, if there's knee walls that's uh, dividing off the upper area, knee walls are when they run from the truss down to your uh, uh, your ceiling joist or the bottom cord on the truss. And if it's a common rafter, common rafter from the common rafter down to the ceiling joist. So that way you are now having a wall assembled in order to uh, form a cube room or a square room or a rectangular room. Those walls would be insulated and uh, sealed uh, in order to give the, the proper uh, heat and uh, cold transfer uh, effect and also uh, the uh, the efficiency levels of that uh, wall insulation. Ventilation is something that will take place in the soffits as well as on the roof line, could be even at the ridge using a, a solid uh, 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 ridge venting system and uh, that would be all taken care of again by inspections and the building code and uh, at the time the roofing is going in place. High efficiency furnaces will have the plastic pipe venting out of the roof. You'll see uh, the two plastic pipes, white pipes normally, or black pipes uh, with uh, elbows on top that, that what gives you that uh, uh, the air movement downwards towards your roof. Now having said all that, that particular type of uh, of uh, heating and air conditioning is not a common um, delivery system 
uh, at this particular time, but it is, to my understanding, becoming somewhat. And if that being the case, I'm going to be following this through, not only for the uh, requirement for this particular homeowner or potential homeowner, uh, as well as myself to uh, be aware that this is taking place and being approved now within Greater Vancouver. Now we're talking Greater Vancouver, keeping in mind that uh, the condensing furnaces have got drains and upper cavity roof cavities are cold and you don't want to have any freezing taking place. So all that has to be uh, aware of at the time and uh, the mechanical engineers that design the heating systems will be certainly responsible for that type of design. The ducting, as octopus was the term that was used, they should be all insulated, sealed and insulated. So all the seams, all the joints of your duct system should be sealed with a proper duct sealer and then insulated because you don't want to be losing heat within the duct system in the uh, the roof cavity. Or they could be uh, uh, foam uh, insulated by blowing foam, uh, like isonine is one of them out there, or the polyurethane uh, spray foam on top of the ducts. So it's a whole new system. Uh, certainly uh, doesn't surprise me anymore uh, because of the narrow lots. And to get the square footage, the narrow lots become homes with basements and uh, get mortgage uh, helpers. Basements become suites. Basement comes suites. You want to have your own uh, control heating system, and that's why they put electric in the basement. So all that being said, it becomes a informational, educational, and referral from myself. When in doubt, don't pout. Let me, Shell Buzzy, help you out. 604-542-2236 locally. In the phone book, Shell Buzzy's house smart. Mike? And on that note, Shell... Uh, we're going to take another quick break, and we'll be right back with more questions from our Housemark Club members, so please stay with us. And now, Ask Shell, brought to you by Serpentine Cedar Roofing, a proud member of Shell Buzzy's House Smart Home Services. Tony Weens from Serpentine Cedar Roofing is often asked why Serpentine is so unique in the roofing business. Tony tells people that for over 30 years, their family has operated their own cedar shake mill and produced only the highest quality cedar roofing shakes. And folks, Serpentine don't cut down any trees to produce their roofing shakes. You heard right, they use only recovered, old-growth western red cedar salvaged from windfalls on the B.C. coast. A Serpentine Cedar Roof is the real deal. Their experienced crew can expertly install your new roof, replace or repair your existing roof, or help you with any of your roofing needs. To arrange a free estimate, visit Serpentine Cedar Roofing online at cedaristherealdeal.com. That's cedaristherealdeal.com. Yeah, welcome back to the Ask Shell webcast. Thanks for being with us today. Um, just referencing our last email, Shell and I were chatting there during the break um, regarding the National Home Warranty Program. Now, builders should be certified and registered with the National Home Warranty Program, which provides a one, a five, and a ten-year warranty. One year being pretty much everything on the inside. So even your appliances would be covered, correct, Shell? That's right. But the one year, the first year of the structure itself, is the first 12 months of your living in that home and that occupancy one year if there's any defects that is going to be repaired for you so if uh, any concerns show up that is something you want to register and make sure that you mark it on your calendar there's nothing worse than having something crop up that you've been putting up with for 13 months and all of a sudden you're told it's a 12 month, which is a first year warranty. Right. And then you get into non-structural and uh, that becomes somewhat of a, uh, a gray area. Of course, of course. So we'll get right back to another uh, email question. This is a, a pretty common one that we, uh, we've seen from time to time. 
How do I remove felt marker stains from a porcelain dryer tub? My guess is somebody left a marker in their pocket. Ah, happens and, a lot. Uh, made it through the wash and dryer. So well, how, would, how would they remove that shelf? Well, you know, uh, on the weekend, I had the problem that I was disposing of a piece of gum, chewing gum, and I got it on my trousers. <laughs> and my trousers got it on the armrest of the vehicle. And then I had a real mess. So gum is one. Uh, and uh, in this particular case is a, another one on the uh, porcelain inner uh, drum of a, uh, a dryer. And uh, one, first of all, the gum. Take care of that with a product called uh, Goof Off or Goo Gone uh, is, uh, is a good one for that. It, it works very well. Uh, the one with the marker on your dryer drum, use a product called Pink Solution. Pink Solution. And it's available, my understanding is, that at grocery stores uh, now. I understand Costco have it as well. Uh, hoping it is a regular item at Costco because sometimes it, they'll have it and they won't have it. But I think it is a 12-month-of-the-year product. Pink Solution. When you open it up, don't look for a pink product. Look for a white product because it's no longer pink. It's white. And the reason why it is white, because they took the uh, odorant out, meaning the, the odor of the product uh, being uh, uh, one that did uh, uh, aggravate, I guess, a number of people that had allergies. So right now it is neutral, no odor, uh, but it sure does a great job. And incidentally, it works on taking crayon off, and it works on... Uh, uh, the likes of uh, washing out felt tip if you happen to get it on your trousers or shirts or children on their uh, dresses, that sort of thing. Okay, so pink solution. If you had the gum problem that I had, goof off or goo gone. It's just that easy, Mike. Okay, one more question before we take a break. Um, my toilet is five years old and has a heavy mineral deposit buildup. It's a very hard buildup from around the hole where the water flows down as opposed to the toilet bowl where the water sits when not in use. This is the main toilet, not the one that, that seldom gets used, so they use it daily. Can you suggest how to get rid of it? You betcha. And uh, that is something today, there's so many items on the market. You see a lot of them on TV. And, you know, one of the things I'd like uh, my uh, viewers to uh, uh, be aware of, uh, and uh, certainly viewers being my club members, folks, from my experience of being a, a TV personality on my TV program, Home Check, you can make anything look perfect because it's called edit. So uh, anything that uh, I've done, we always take it to the nth degree. We make it work or it doesn't get on the show. I wouldn't be sitting here answering emails unless I knew the products that I'm talking about were going to work. But when you become label readers and go out to stores and people that are waiting on you as customer service people saying, I really don't know, let's read the label, that can become a notorious money grab, meaning that products are bought that don't work. And when that takes place, there's a lot of money going down the drain. So it's, it's not something that... Uh, I highly recommend, but on a toilet that has a buildup residual from the mineral in the water, you have to, first of all, start out with a dry toilet bowl, meaning no water in the toilet bowl. Okay, so you sponge it out. Wear your rubber gloves. I know this is not a, a nice task. It's not one that people look forward to, and uh, but you've got to take the water out of the bowl. Once you got the water out of the bowl, now you can work within that bowl using the products that are going to do the job. Now, having said to take the water out, I'm going to ask you to take a trigger bottle, that's a spray bottle, and you can buy them at your local hardware store. They're not expensive. And buy a couple of them, two of them, and put water in one, and muriatic acid in the other. Now, muriatic acid, you might say, oh, my goodness, I don't want to be working with acid. Well, acid uh, is going to be the property that's going to remove uh, your concern. Now, you can buy it. It comes in a plastic-wrapped bottle. Uh, please uh, caution. Take good care of it. Protect it. Follow the instructions on it. 
and then you won't have the problem. You don't put your nose up to it and try to smell what it smells like because it has a vapor that is not nice, and it is one of those products that will, in fact, not harm because of the mixing with water, will not harm the environment. So have a water spray bottle of water and a water spray bottle of muriatic acid. You very simply spray the water in, make it a spray coating, and then spray right afterwards the, uh, the muriatic acid. You'll find that what, and wear your protective gloves, your rubber gloves, and protective eyewear, safety goggles, and wear a long sleeve shirt. Obviously, you want to cover yourself up. And spray it on, and let it sit. You'll see it actually bubble, and you'll see a kind of a white foam come off it. And that is it's breaking down the mineral deposit that's on your uh, on the china, on the toilet uh, uh, surface, okay, the ceramic. And after you've done this uh, two or three times over a period of, say, 15 to 20 minutes, then you can use a, a brush. You can use an abrasive sponge uh, to remove the deposit. And let's keep repeating that until such time as you've got it all. And don't forget up around the underside of the rim where the water comes down. You may even want to get in there with a uh, uh, something like a drill bit, a uh, drill bit that's put into the holes just to turn it with your fingers, okay, just to clean out the holes, make sure that everything's nice, and you'll have to size it to make sure that the right size. But just to make sure that the size uh, is not going to damage the, the surface on the, uh, the porcelain, okay, on the ceramic finish. So once you've done that, clean it up, give it a real good polishing up. And what do you polish it with? You polish it the same way as you would polish your countertop or even your automobile. Uh, put in a little bit of uh, car polish there and buff it up and uh, turn the water back on, fill her up, and uh, away you go. It's just that easy, Mike. And we have to take a break, and this is our final break for the show. So we'll come back. We have a question about a, a homeowner that wants to convert his uh, old oil slash wood combination furnace to something to do with uh, hopefully his electrical supply, so electrical furnace or, or uh, baseboard heat. So please stay with us. We'll be back in a minute, and uh, we'll see you soon. Folks, what is House Smart? Well, it's 10 years of experience putting a program together that has really worked for you, the homeowner. It's free for your use. We charge the trade, and there's no upcharge whatsoever to you, the homeowner. Also, they're certified. We certify them. We make sure, good, better, best, they are the best because they're right there with me on their shoulder. My brand, folks, you can be assured that you're going to get the job done right. Hi, Shell Buzzy here for my Shell Buzzy's Home Improvements. Right now is a perfect time to talk with our full-service home renovation department. They're the experts with kitchen and bathroom designs and renovations, additions, basement suites, and all exterior repairs. Projects big or small, folks, we do them all. Folks, my name, Shell Buzzy, assures you the job is being done right. Call us at 604 542-2236 or online askshell.com Welcome back to the show. This is the last segment for the show today, so we'll jump right back into another email from one of our House Smart Club members. I have a question about converting my house to electric heat. He's a 30-year-old wood slash oil combination furnace that needs to be replaced. He's considering an electric furnace, but not sure if he has enough room in his breaker boxes. So he's looking at possibly doing electric baseboard heaters. He needs six heaters upstairs, and he'd have enough breaker boxes for that, but he doesn't know if he has enough breaker boxes for an electric furnace, because I guess the, the draw for the electrical supply would be higher, or he feels that it would be. He lives on a farm and does not have access to gas easily. Propane's another option, but he'd like to know what kind of options you'd suggest with respect to using electrical as his source for the uh, the heat supply? Well, Mike, there's certainly uh, lots of um, options here. And uh, he's obviously brought up some that, because he has been doing some homework. And uh, electric, as far as uh, amperage of the service that's in the house is very important, obviously. 
And he being uh, out on a rural property, I would venture a guess that he's got a 100 amp service. And the 100 amp service can be upgraded with a sub panel that he could add another, uh, possibly even a, a say up to 100 uh, amps. Uh, certainly 60 uh, or 40 would be quite common. So it's going to require the electrician to calculate what the overall uh, demand load is going to be for the home. And then from that point, boosting uh, uh, the supply by a sub panel. Uh, having the information uh, in place uh, as far as uh, total amperage uh, will now be the deciding point as to what do you do uh, with the rest of the home. He's uh, obviously planning on using baseboard heaters uh, for the one uh, area and uh, because he did indicate uh, so many heaters required for that floor. But I hope that the heaters are not just strip baseboard electric heaters. I hope that they would uh, go the next step and go into a product like Convect Air. And folks, if you... Uh, are interested in finding out more about Convect Air, you are a member, go to our referral network, type in uh, Convect Air in the search uh, uh, box, and you will get the full information on uh, Convect Air because it's a great product. In fact, we use them in our office. I use them in my shop at home. They uh, fasten to the wall, but up off the floor, not like the traditional strip baseboard heater that goes down very close to the floor, which incidentally are less efficient than the convect air. Convect air would be anywhere up to 30% less operational costs. So we'll leave that, but consider convect air. And I dare say, consider convect air for the entire house because it's not necessary for you, for an example, to have an electric furnace. You can have the uh, being out on the farm, you can have electric uh, convect air heaters uh, supplying the heat source for the entire home. But preferably, uh, it sounds as though you would like to go to a furnace, and you'll very likely see anywhere from a 40 to 60 amps. But in any event, forced air gives you that replacement for the oil and wood uh, com combination that you're taking out. Also, another thing I should make reference to, don't overlook the fact that the outdoor furnace, and I see a number of outdoor furnaces now being used in uh, the Fraser Valley, which is uh, just east of the uh, city of Vancouver. And uh, they are very efficient, especially if you live on a farm and you've got a lot of uh, uh, wood available as far as uh, uh, types of wood that you can use, like alder or maple or birch or uh, ash or... Uh, apple or any of those for uh, a burning in the wood burning uh, uh, feature. So those are options, but an electric furnace allows you not only to have air circulating, not only allows you to adapt to an existing uh, duct system, not only uh, uh, allows you to put in air filtration uh, like the IQ air, which is now a big uh, uh, benefit to people who have allergies and uh, also the other thing that enables you to do when you're in a cold climate is uh, putting in uh, uh, humidification. So all of that is going to be something that's very uh, uh, effective and available for a forced air system which obviously you're used to. So electrician would be the first person I'd have out uh, to give you a load uh, requirement for your home and then from there, you be the one to decide. Uh, oil would even be, but again, delivery is uh, an inconvenience if it happens to be out where oil is not available or delivery services are not available. So all of that being said, and you are obviously considering electric, uh, I just say consider the convect air and consider the electric furnace with the options of the electric furnace being humidification, cleansing of the air, and uh, comfort. It's just that easy. Mike? Perfect timing. Our show is out of time. Oh, again. So, again, that hour went by really fast. So we'd, uh, we'd like to thank everybody for being with us. Thank you to our club members for sending in questions through our website that we could use during the show. 
And please keep in mind that you can watch the show anytime on our website. Just visit askshell.com. You can pause it, <clears throat> fast forward it, rewind it, all that kind of stuff. So it's just like a PVR at your home, but it's on your computer. So again, thanks for being with us today. We'll have a new show for you next Sunday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time right on askshell.com. And I'll turn it over to Shell for a couple last words. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, thank you, folks, for being with us today. And uh, Mike has given you all the uh, items of interest as far as watching the show again or watching previous shows and uh, information that's coming up uh, in future shows. The future shows are all fueled by your emails. And your emails are a real uh, asset to not only the answers for yourself, but the answers for those other members, our other club members that are viewing this show as well. So folks, keep up the good work. Thank you for being with us uh, on a weekly basis here on the Shell Buzzy House Smart webcast. And uh, I tell you, ask Shell. You can ask me anything about your home. We'll certainly take care of it. So AskShell.com. Until next week, my name is Shell Buzzy with Mike. And Jim, have a great week. Love you all. Bye-bye for now. Hey, folks, it's just that easy. Hey, folks, it's just that easy. You mix it up, you fix it up, you do it yourself. He can turn your little shack into a first-class castle. Save you time and money and a great big hassle. Hey, folks, it's just that easy. You mix it up, you fix it up, you sand it down, you paint it brown, you measure twice, you cut it once. It's just that easy.